Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you welcome to the economics le lecture, which is held by this year's uh, laureate uh, in economics, uh, Professor Angus Deaton. And you see, you will see him alive in a moment. You see his a cartoon there where he looks at the earth in a microscope and it's sort of meant to convey the image that he has been studying consumption in different perspectives, the large, very large picture of macroeconomic consumption and the very small picture of individual consumers' decisions, individual households' decisions to consume. You will hear more about it during the lecture, I'm sure. Um, let's look at the official motivation for the prize, which reads, for his analysis of consumption, poverty and welfare. And a few uh, biographical details. He, was, he grew up in Edinburgh, in Scotland, studied and got his PhD in Cambridge, England, and now he lives in Princeton, the United States. And I think I shouldn't say anything more, so I just wish you welcome. Professor Deaton, please enter the stage. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a true wonder to be here, and I'm enormously grateful um, for this award. And today I'm going to talk a little bit um, about some of the work I did that was cited in the award. So I'm going to talk about behavior, uh, welfare, um, and um, poverty. Um, there are some themes that I want to highlight um, from the beginning. Um, one of them is perhaps the overriding thing that gains, that has guided a tremendous amount of my work um, over the years, um, which is inquiring into policy that makes people, people um, better off, um, that can improve um, well-being. If you think about this in the context of global poverty, for example, the problem here, I think, is not that there's any lack of tools and policies. There are many, many policies out there for whom advocates believe that they can make the world a better place. But the key thing here is using measurement um, as honest scorekeeping to find out whether something's actually working or whether it's not working at all. And one of the themes I'll emphasize throughout is the enormous importance of measurement almost by itself. We're always told there's no measurement without theory, and while that's true, um, it's more true just to say that measurement is incredibly important, and it's often forgotten in economics just how important measurement is. The other theme I'm going to talk about throughout is individuals versus aggregates or averages. Um, in a world in which you work entirely on averages, if you look at the macro economy, um, things like inequality and poverty are simply not legible um, without disaggregation. Um, without the details of individuals. The other thing is, even if you're only interested in the aggregate economy, um, distribution clearly matters for aggregate economic activity and certainly for any serious analysis of well-being. Finally, we know that behavior and well-being are linked for individuals. They're not linked for aggregates. So what you see from the macroeconomy doesn't necessarily tell you by itself whether people are doing better um, or doing worse. There's a theme which runs through a lot of my work and which is being challenged, um, and I'm sympathetic to that challenge, which is that if people by and large behave in their own interests, then by looking at their behavior, we can infer quite a lot about how they are doing. It's what economists call revealed preference analysis, and it's always been, long been the standard um, in economics. I'm going to start at the very oldest stuff and come up to stuff I've been doing relatively recently and then move back more chronologically. So starting with household surveys, um, surveys which inquired into people's living standards started in the 18th century, late in the 18th century, and have always been used then and now 
as measurement for social monitoring and for activism. The idea being to find out how ordinary people live and by documenting how ordinary people live, to bring that to the attention of the ruling classes, often to shock them with the terrible living standards of the poor and to shock those people into trying doing something. So measurement as part of activism has been very important. Dollar a day poverty measures do the same thing today, as do data on infant mortality and stunting and wasting um, in ch children. This sort of simple documentation is not just for poor countries. I mean, in rich countries today, we all know about stagnant or falling real median wages over time in the United States and in some other countries. The incredible rises in income inequality that have again taken place um, throughout many rich countries and occasional rising mortality rates, but using mortality rates as some sort of key um, for what's happening um, to the population. Another application that runs particularly in poor countries is in agricultural households, just documenting whether these people are net consumers or net producers um, of staple foods like rice or wheat can tell you a lot to the first order about whether they're harmed or hurted by agricultural policy or by tariff changes. And these are again examples of measurements that are just unbelievably important in their own right and take you a long way um, towards thinking about policy. One of the most famous things, of course, is the analysis of household budgets, um, going back to Ernst Engel um, in the 19th century, who looked at the food share and noticed that richer households spend a smaller share of their budget on food than poorer households. And there's been a long subsequent literature trying to use that as an indicator of welfare. Um, another theme in that literature is looking at how children alter the consumption patterns of households. And underlying that has been a theme of trying to measure the costs of children, whatever that means. That's been a very difficult um, area. Um, another issue that I worked on is whether budgets are different if the kids are girls or if the kids are boys, if you hold everything else constant. And in my work and in several other replications, um, people have actually found it surprisingly hard um, to find um, evidence of discrimination that way, um, even when um, you see the um, discrimination in society as a whole. Another issue which I think is of lasting importance and has been much highlighted recently is why in spite of rapid economic growth um, in India is per capita calorie consumption falling in spite of the mass malnourishment, especially among kids, that exists in India. You would expect in a rapidly growing economy with much malnourishment that calorie consumption would be rising rapidly. In fact, it's falling. We don't, again, really know why that happens. Um, how do budget patterns change as the household becomes larger? And again, there's some major puzzles of there. On this, I wanted to highlight India. Uh, many of these questions have great importance for India. Much of the work has been done on Indian data. And India was really the home of probability sampling when Mahalanobis started crop surveys in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and founded the National Sample Survey Organization, which has played a large role in this analysis, including um, in my work. One of the things you'd like to know with surveys is you want to know how people respond to prices, and I'm gonna talk about that quite a bit. Um, normally, you can't do that from surveys, but some surveys collect data on quantities as well as expenditures, so you know for a household that they bought three kilos of rice and paid so much for it over the last week. So you can get some idea of how much they paid for each kilo, and you can use that to analyze um, responses to prices across different space. One of the interesting things about that work is it tends to show these spatial price responses tend to be quite large, um, suggesting that long-run responses, which is what you're perhaps picking up across space, um, are larger than short-run responses. This is important because it suggests that the short-run policy response, the short-run price response that we usually model may greatly underestimate the distortions um, which policy might cause um, in the long run. I wanted to highlight, too, some open issues here. One is, in these household survey data, the quality of the data are often not up to the task which is put to them. This is particularly true in Africa, but not always in Africa. There's also widespread throughout the world, and perhaps it's worse in India, a conflict between the data that comes from the national accounts and the data that come from the household surveys. 
And so in India, the growth that everyone is so very proud of in GDP per capita really does not show up to anything like the same extent in the household surveys. This really means that you cannot have a coherent discussion about well-being, inequality, and poverty in India because the two sources of data for which you'd be able to connect up growth with poverty and inequality are mutually inconsistent, and you really can't see anything sensible. And then what happens is each political side picks its own database, and they go to a completely fruitless war talking against each other, and the data never get improved. Um, India is perhaps the worst case here, but these problems exist really widely um, throughout the world. I wanted to say a few words about international comparisons, because if you're going to compute global poverty or look at the state of the world's poor, you've got to have some method of comparable, making comparable measurements across different countries with different currencies and different um, consumption patterns. Um, one of the greatest intellectual achievements in measurement over the last 50 years is the International Comparison Program, which was begun at Penn by Cravius, Summers, and Heston. Alan Heston is sitting in the front row here um, in 1968. Um, it's an enormous achievement, which sadly has never been recognized here in the way that it should have been. Um, the ICP is still very active, both in measurement and conceptual um, advances. And indeed, there remain very large challenges. And it's, uh, I also find it a little sad that relatively few economists work on this in spite of the enormous intellectual challenges that there are there to do it. So let me move on to some of the earlier work I did on analyzing consumption patterns. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, demand analysis, as it's called, the study of consumption patterns, was concerned with using aggregate data um, to fit the quantities consumed to prices, to data on prices and income. I came to Cambridge, um, to the Cambridge Growth Model as a research assistant um, in the late 1960s, and I was asked to look after the demand system estimation and to think about consumption and saving in the growth model. This was a project headed by Richard Stone, who was the Nobel laureate in 1984. Um, that was the impetus for much that I did subsequently. Or indeed, if you were being unkind, you should think that I was given this task as an RA, and I'm still working on it almost 50 years um, later, having never found anything better to do. Or at least I find lots of fascinating things to do there. When, when I showed up in 1969, um, Stone's linear expenditure system was used as part of the growth model. Um, it's a very simple case of additive preferences, which um, without going into that in detail, what it does is it gives you a very tight link between the way demands respond to income and the way that demands respond to prices. Now, think of 1969, 1970, we were working with about 18 annual observations instead of the millions and millions of observations we have today. So having a very restricted, tight specification like this was extremely useful. In fact, it's probably all you could have done um, in those days. But and I remember this troubling me from the very beginning when I worked on this, that we were basically assuming answers that we ought to be measuring them. And I always find that extremely um, troubling. So we needed more general, um, but still tractable models. I was also worried from the very beginning about the nature of the representative agent assumption that was built into these models, that we were pretending there was one single person um, who was behaving for the whole aggregate economy. So how did that come about? Well, it turned out that a lot of the results were actually known um, at that time. And Terence Gorman, who played a very important part in my life, had proved the results on aggregation over goods and aggregation over people. He'd proved these results in papers in the 1950s and 1960s. The trouble is these papers use the dual representation of preferences in which you think of well-being as defined by prices and incomes rather than by quantities. And if you'd grown up studying conventional economics, those papers were incredibly hard to read at that time. They don't seem so hard now. And I remember going off to try to read those papers and locking myself in a room for a week. And I was determined that I would not come out of the room until I'd really understood what that paper was about. And I came out at the end of the week, and I knew absolutely no more than I did um, at the beginning of the week. But slowly, there began to be a little bit of understanding. 
Um, Dan McFadden at the same time um, had realized these results were known to theorists, but there were relatively few people of which Gorman and McFadden were the most notable who had understood that this dual representation was really the way to derive theoretically consistent demands that were analytically convenient for actually adapting and studying the data. So that was the, the major breakthrough that those two guys understood and not too many other people at the time um, did. Now, John Muelbauer is sitting here too and I'm gonna talk a little bit about him. John came back to the UK from doing a PhD in Berkeley in 1969. Um, he had been advised by Bob Hall um, I recently asked Bob Hall, you know, where did your lecture notes come from? He said, I just stole them from Dan McFadden. So, you know, Dan McFadden was sort of behind um, a lot of this um, at the time. And Dan had these wonderful lecture notes on consumer and producer theory um, using duality, which I remember became a sort of Bible. Again, you people today cannot imagine how the world was before the web and when people had written these incredibly important papers but never published them and getting a hold of them was unbelievably difficult. I mean, you almost had to send rescue squads in to find these papers and steal them and bring them. But when John came back from Berkeley, we met each other and we realized that we knew a lot of the same material um, that was otherwise not so very well known and we decided that it was a really good thing to pool what we knew and explain our newfound knowledge to the world as a whole. A very arrogant thing for two kids and their 20 year olds to do. Um, but that eventually turned into our joint text on economics and consumer behavior. Now at the same time, we wanted to get away from the problems with a model like the linear expenditure system and built a better tool for analyzing demand. And so we spent, I think, probably a year and a half or so um, tinkering and fiddling, trying to find a really good, a perfect um, demand system. Um, much of this was based on John Muelbar's earlier work on aggregation on a functional form. Another important thread on this was Erwin Dewart's work on flexible functional forms, which broke this very tight restriction and allowed you to fit something that was about as general as could possibly be hang handled. So we tinkered with these dual representations to get a convenient, easy to estimate demand system. We almost got everything we wanted and that was why it was called the almost ideal demand system. Um, and it still remains very widely um, used today. It's certainly not a perfect model, but one of the things it did that had not been done in these demands before was it got away from the representative agent at least to the point where inequality played a role in the pattern of the demand um, in a serious way. And that was really the contribution of John's work on um, aggregation um, came to its fruition in this joint work that we did together. So let me move on from the consumer demand to intertemporal choice, which was the third area that the committee um, had identified. Um, and talk about saving um, first. Um, there were two papers, famous papers, written by Franco Medigliani and Richard Brum Brumberg, who was, I think, a graduate student at the time, that were um, written in the 1950s, only one of which was published um, in an edited volume, and the other one was available, and I remember reading it even when I was an undergraduate um, in Cambridge um, in the library. Um, Brumberg died very, very young, and I think Franco Medigliani um, never really had the heart to publish that paper. So once again, it remained a sort of secret document. Um, when I read those two papers, to me, it was a revelation of how I wanted to do economics and really shaped a lot of what I've tried to do ever since. Um, these models have this very clear, very simple um, theoretical structure um, in which the life cycle is modeled. They give you a way of thinking about an issue of enormous importance for understanding the well-being of people and for understanding public policy. Almost anything to do with savings and pensions, for instance, you have to think about it in some form like this. The other thing that impressed me enormously about those papers was when they were written, a lot of people had worked on savings and consumption and there was a mess of results, mutually contradictory results from cross-section time series, cross countries, all sorts of stuff, and no one understood how it hung together or any coherent sense. 
And those papers systematically said, here is the story which can actually reconcile a huge amount of this evidence. So it gave you a lens in which suddenly everything came into focus and you could figure out um, what was actually going on. The other thing that appealed to me then and appeals to me now, and I love to tell non-economists um, about this when they say, what has economics ever done that's not obvious? Um, in the life cycle hypothesis, each person doesn't do any savings over their life cycle, the simplest version at least, because they accumulate wealth when they're young and they spend it when they're old, and so their net savings over their life cycle is nothing. And you might say, well, how can that explain an economy in which there's net savings? And what Medigliani realized was that in a growing economy, the young people were savings on a larger scale than the elderly were dissaving. And therefore, when you aggregate it up to the economy as a whole, you get a completely different result from the individual behavior in which rate of growth effects produced the savings rates. I mean, this is really wonderful. This is the opposite of a representative agent. And it's not just thinking about aggregation as being a nuisance to be gotten rid of. It's actually a positive force for coming out and understanding the world. And I, I, this to me was an enormous revelation. And one of the sadder things about my later wife is, life is the work that Chris Paxson and I did in which we pretty much convinced ourselves to my great distress um, that this story is not right. Um, and that you know, the evidence can be hard, e even to really very beautiful um, pieces of theory. Um, there were also a number of major innovations in the 1970s. And I've been trying in the last few weeks to trace this back, um, which was a simultaneous theory of life cycle labor supply and commodity demands. And it's clear that Jim Heckman's Princeton PhD thesis in 1971 was a very important part of this. There was that important work by Becker, um, Gilbert Gaz, by Heckman, and then later a very famous paper by Tom McCurdy. This is a world in which it's realized that intertemporally additive preferences can give you demand systems within each period of the form that we'd always used, um, except instead of income, these were linked together by the marginal utility of money, which solved, which enforced the life cycle um, wealth constraint. The thing that was also beautiful about that formulation was that it allowed you to incorporate uncertainty, which is something that many of us were still struggling with empirically at that time. Um, and the marginal utility of wealth evolves as a martingale difference if um, this model is sort of working in the right way. When we first started working on that, I developed a method of tracking birth cohorts through successive independent household surveys. Um, you would really like to have panel data, which is what McCurdy had used, um, but that's very hard to do, and I developed this tool that in some ways was not just an inferior substitute, but gave a different way of using data that were much, much more widely available and had certain advantages um, to track um, what was happening over time. I'll come back to that. In the paper with Martin Browning and Margaret Irish, we were somewhat skeptical that the model actually explained anything very much. Um, and wages, for instance, are hump-shaped over the life cycle, they rise in middle age. Um, according to the simple version of the theory, consumption should be much flatter, but it isn't, it's hump-shaped too. We also found that the business cycle and life cycle frequencies of consumption and savings really could not be easily reconciled. Now, there's been enormous later work following this up using the same sort of cohort methods, and that later work has been much more positive than we were, though I'm not totally convinced, if only because it's come at a great cost in terms of simplicity. It may, of course, also be true, as we first thought, that these simple life cycle models are not true and that people may not be able to easily borrow um, and spend as is assumed in those models. So that after doing that, um, I moved on to thinking about what became known as buffer stock um, savings. Um, this is a world in which people can't borrow to fund their consumption, and so they can only accumulate their own assets and spend it. Um, this again seemed particularly relevant in developing countries where there were very poor credit markets um, and possibly very high um, interest rates. Now, Guy Laroque, who's also here, and I had started working around the same time on the mathematically identical model of commodity prices, which had been developed by Gustafsson at the University of Chicago in their 30s. And with a lot of help from Guy, um, I worked on this within the consumption um, context. 
And this is one of the very few pieces of work in my life where I've taken what is nowadays called a dynamic structural approach um, to the data. And I learned an enormous amount from that, which is why I've always been fairly sympathetic um, to um, this approach. Um, one of the things that these models produce is that people do not live hand to mouth. They don't simply spend their income in every period. Um, and although they rarely hit the borrowing constraint, they behave very differently because of the presence of the budget, the borrowing constraint. So this is a sort of magic feature of this model that you put this potential threat in there and it completely changes people's behavior um, even though the threat is never actually materialized. And so that was something I learned um, from doing this work that I had no idea at all. And people do save and dissave to smooth and protect themselves against the lean years and the fluctuations in their incomes. And subsequently, that model and related models have become one of the basic workhorses um, for thinking about savings and consumption. Another great innovation in the 1970s at the same time had been Bob Hall's work. And actually, I remember John Milbar bringing me that paper um, when we were in Bristol together and saying, you've got to read this paper. Um, and Bob had reworked Friedman's permanent income theory um, using rational expectations ideas, which were um, very new and current um, at the time. And this, this is what is sometimes called the random walk theory of consumption, and it opened up an enormous subsequent torrent of research. One of the things that was very useful to me was that within that framework, in very simple cases, um, it was possible to derive explicit formulas which told you what the change in consumption should be when there were innovations in the stochastic process driving earnings. So if you could model the stochastic process driving earnings, you got very precise statements about what should be happening to consumption, a wonderful thing for an empiricist to have and to look at. But I was very puzzled when I was doing this because I thought I'd gone crazy um, and I was getting wildly inconsistent, contradictory results. And what turned out there was that if you took what at that time was the most popular and plausible stochastic process for earnings, it actually implied that the permanent income hypothesis had the opposite implications for why the permanent in income hypothesis had been invented, um, which was that it predicted that consumption should not be smoother than income, which it is in the data, but that consumption should be less smooth than data. So it was this, here was this basic theory taught in every textbook, and it actually had the opposite predictions to what people um, had thought. People got very angry with me for writing that paper, and I remember being shouted at in seminars um, and told that if I couldn't do anything better than that, I should go and be a fly fisherman or something um, more useful. Though one counterexample to that was I got a letter, which I really prized at the time, um, from Bob Solo, which started off saying, this is a fan letter, and then just told me how wonderful he thought that paper was. So was someone was on my side. Uh, of course, there are lots of ways of resolving this paradox, and one of which, once again, is to work with individual data and not work at the aggregates. Um, because one of the things, there are many parts of this resolution, but one of the things that is true um, is that um, the stochastic process for individuals, when you aggregate them up to the economy as a whole, um, completely changed their stochastic properties. So in some sense, this whole thing was a false dichotomy, but it reinforced once again that we should be working at the micro level and not working at aggregates. So the final thing I want to talk about is the consumption inequality. Um, this is work I did with Chris Paxson. Um, and the random walk theory of consumption has another startling implication, which is if you take a bunch of people um, and you put them outside the door here of the Aula Magna, um, you take 100 people and you instruct them to walk off randomly in all directions, and you go away for a day or two, and then you come back, they will be scattered all over Stockholm, even though they started in exactly the same place. Um, and so this, even each one of them is, has an increment to their behavior at any given time that's a stationary stochastic process, you're generating this non-stationary behavior. It's sort of like a people sitting around a roulette wheel um, and they start with all the same stacks, but in the end they finish up some people with big stacks and some people with small stacks. So this, um, this um, risk, um, even stationary risk, can be accumulated into consumption inequality that wealth inequality increases um, even more rapidly than consumption inequality, unless, of course, there's some offset, for instance, from insurance arrangements in society, 
that tie together people's earnings or tie together the consumption independently of their earnings. And so you can then use the spread of consumption over time to assess the degree to which society is actually insuring its members. It's sort of a very important idea um, in economics as to what extent societies do insure their members against the ravages um, of luck. Um, Chris Paxson and I found that in several countries we looked at, the data behaved in the way that we predicted, um, which of course is subject to what I think of as Popper's curse. You know, Popper, sa Popper says that if you reject a hypothesis, you learn something. Of course, you're much more pleased if you confirm your hypothesis if no one's looked at that before. But Popper's curse is that someone else will think up of another explanation for that, and it doesn't prove your theories right um, at all. Um, nevertheless, these ideas, the spreading inequality and the matching of these higher moments of consumption to the data, have become a sort of central idea in what is called um, heterogeneous agent macroeconomics um, today. Um, and the modeling of the stochastic process of earnings um, is a very central area too. Now in the brief I was given, I was told to talk about my discoveries. I think they probably send this text to everybody and it's not entirely clear whether economists are supposed to have discoveries. Um, and I think of discoveries as sort of apples falling on your head. Um, but those apples only set off good ideas if someone has prepared your head um, before. And so it's a very collaborative activity. So I wrote down some of the things I'm most proud of. Um, one is something I haven't talked about, which is um, early in my career, when Ted Heath was Prime Minister of Britain and the government lost control of inflation. And I was a young father and I would go to the store and I thought all individual relative prices were going up because there was all this unanticipated inflation. So I predicted that this unanticipated inflation would actually increase savings without people wanting to increase savings. And I thought that was a ridiculous prediction and so did everyone in the common room at Cambridge and I was widely laughed at um, until it became true. Um, in the data. Of course, then Popper's curse strikes again, strike again, and there are lots of other stories for why that might be happening. But uh, for me, that was the first time in my life that I came up with a prediction that seemed ridiculous and turned out to be borne out um, in the data. I've talked a little bit already about the creating panel data from a time series of cross-section, which is more a tool than a discovery. Um, but it's helped investigate a wide range of substantive questions, and it's now a standard um, technique, um, more by macro than micro people. Um, I've talked about my realization that popular accounts of the permanent income hypothesis were self-contradictory, and that's again been very productive. Um, and I realized, and I think this is probably the thing that um, I'm most um, proud of to this day, is the work that Chris Paxton and I did, um, realizing that these various um, filtering behaviors or responsive behaviors so that you can have a driving stochastic process um, in which there's completely uncorrelated risk, which nevertheless can drive in rising inequality. I mean, something that I think is very relevant for what we're going to do today. So I'm almost out of time and I just wanted to end by um, showing you um, some pictures of some of the people I've collaborated with over the years. There's John Mulebar sitting down there, um, Guy Laroque. Um, Chris Paxson will be here tomorrow, Martin Browning. Um, this is John Campbell. This is my friend John Drez, um, who I work with in India. Um, here's Alan Heston and Bettina Atten, who are sitting in the front row here. And most recently, I've been working on well-being with Danny Kahneman and Arthur Stone um, and trying to bridge the sometimes unbridgeable gaps um, between economists and psychologists. Um, and then these are people that I never wrote papers with, um, but whose work had a really definitive effect on the shape of my own work. Um, there's Richard Stone, who really was my mentor, um, who won the prize in 1984. Um, you can see I've been imitating his bow tie ever since, though I don't think I've ever dared risk this combination of stripes. <laughs> Um, that he um, had there. Um, never mind the black onyx cigarette holder, um, which was sort of very much a part of the pattern too. Um, there's Terence Gorman um, up at the top here. This is the only photograph I could find. I even went to the Econometric Society archives 
and very characteristically, Terence Gorman never turned in his photograph as president of the Econometric Society. So you can find the president in the year before and the president in the year after, but there's no photograph in the 1973 archives at all. That's Franco Medigliani, who found out that I was working on life cycle um, hypotheses long before I knew enough to talk to Franco and was completely overwhelmed. The same was true with Terence Gorman. I mean, he always assumed you knew more than he did, did which was terribly bewildering um, until you got a lot further along. There's Jim Heckman um, on the top right there, um, who is, again, not just in life cycle work, but in many other things I've done in my life has been quite a decisive influence. That's Amartya Sen, um, who I haven't really talked about, but his, um, he has been responsible for what I think of as a lifetime commitment to thinking ethically about the implications of my work and trying to bring some sort of ethical dimension to economics. There's um, Dan McFadden, um, who with Terence was one of the early people who brought duality to demand. And there's Bob Hall on the bottom right who did this splendid work um, on consumption functions and changed everything around 1978. So thank, with thanks to them and thanks to you all for listening, thank you very much indeed. particularly interesting for us on the committee who have studied this work but didn't really know all these threads back in history. There was the one detail that maybe you didn't know, maybe you left it out for the sake of brevity, and that which we discovered when we were preparing the report on you, and that was that uh, one of the fundamental papers by John Mühlbauer on aggregation was actually first published as a working paper in economics here at Stockholm University in 1976. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's our claim to fame in this prize. <laughs> um, so I suppose we give a warm applause not only to Angus Deaton, but also to those people that he has mentioned, uh, some of whom are actually here with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.